So did something in Flight 447's path bring it down? Cable hunts for clues buried in over 400 pages of data released by the French authorities and finds one crucial fact. There was thunderstorm activity in that area, quite a large trail across the uh, flight path at the time that AF-447 went through. At 2.10 a.m., Flight 447 is in the vicinity of an Atlantic thunderstorm. 250 miles wide. Did it cause the crash? To find out, our investigation turns to John Williams, an aviation weather specialist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Williams has access to new satellite images taken by NASA on the actual night of the crash. They show a massive storm developing as Flight 447 approaches. I'll step through by 30 minute intervals and you'll see these storm systems starting to grow. The final position of Flight 447 is marked on the top of the map. This storm system is hundreds of miles across and maybe 60 miles wide. Wow, look at the size of that growth right there. Pilots are trained to avoid large storms like this. The idea that a pilot would fly through a thunderstorm, absolutely not. Pilots remember at the front end of the airplane, the first people to meet any accident. We have a great incentive not to meet accidents. So why is Flight 447 flying straight into the storm? In daylight, the thunderclouds would span the horizon, towering from the ocean to 50,000 feet. But at night, the pilots can't see them, so they use onboard weather radar. This radar has a limited range of around 50 miles, and it can't see wind or lightning. It works by detecting the water and ice in storm clouds, but ice is five times less reflective than water, and pilots must continually adjust radar settings to see storms of different size and intensity. At the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Williams pours through the NASA satellite data from that night and makes an important find not mentioned in the French reports. And what you can see is that there's a small storm that as they approached it may have blocked their radar's view of a larger storm system and a more hazardous storm system behind. Williams' new theory, Flight 447's weather radar can't see through the smaller storm to detect the larger storm system building behind. You could find yourself in a position with this absorption of the signal where you are almost into the storm before the, the signal strength actually reflects the reality. This is crucial in understanding what happened to Flight 447. It's possible that by the time the pilots detect the now massive storm, they are already in it. You have no option but to take the least worst exit. The crew must ride it out. They face two potential threats. The first, lightning. On average, every airplane is struck once a year. But modern airliners are made of conductive materials that protect against even the most severe lightning as seen in this incident captured on home video in Australia. Spectacular, but the lightning passes harmlessly through the outer skin. The plane landed safely, with no significant damage. The last confirmed commercial plane crash in the US directly attributed to lightning occurred in 1967. 
the thought that lightning could have a serious effect in the accident of Air France 447 is extraordinarily remote, and there's absolutely no evidence of it. The second threat is more serious. Turbulence. One cause is updrafts. Rising pockets of air punching up through storms. The white areas on this map. There's one here and one here just off the flight track of Air France 447. Hitting an updraft would be like a jackhammer hitting you from below. It could really give the aircraft a jolt. As flight 447 heads for turbulence, the automatic systems should keep everything under control. The pilot's next move would be standard procedure. Anticipating turbulence, he would ask the passengers to fasten seat belts. Then, as a safety measure, he would dial in a slightly lower speed to reduce the stresses on the aircraft. An automatic system called auto thrust takes over. The auto thrust would reduce the power on the engines to slow down towards your target speed. Everything happens automatically. The pilot's manual thrust levers don't move. As turbulence hits, sudden updrafts throw the aircraft up and down. But the flight computer changes pitch and engine power to compensate, keeping the aircraft at a safe speed. All the pilots have to do is monitor the instruments. The systems automatically will tell you if they get out of limits, but you could be looking at the systems from time to time just to check that they are well inside limits. The team has traced Flight 447's progress to its last known position. The next clue comes from the official French report, and it reveals what happened next in chilling detail. As the aircraft is navigating through the storm at 2.10 a.m., the flight computer sends a flurry of fault messages to Air France headquarters in Paris. We were fortunate that the aircraft, being one of the most modern, has a maintenance feature that automatically reports system anomalies, and it does it through a data link system called ACARS. Normally, these ACARS messages are designed for basic aircraft maintenance, so ground crews can fix minor faults quickly when the aircraft is on the ground. In simplistic terms, it's almost like SMS texting for airplanes. It's a way of sending simple text messages or numerical messages from the aircraft to the ground and back again, and it's used to send some very basic information. Airline crews on the ground don't usually monitor the data in real time. Often, the messages are downloaded just prior to the aircraft's arrival. But now, Flight 447's ACARS system messages reveal an incredible chain of events. It really is the last will and testament of the aircraft. Flight 447 suffers 24 critical faults in just four minutes and 16 seconds. You can just see an aircraft almost dying in front of you. Tony Cable decodes the data to reconstruct events second by second. The first one appears at 2.10 a.m. and 10 seconds. The first ACAS message that appears is autopilot off and that indicates that the autopilot has disengaged on its own. There is a master audio warning, which is a real attention getter. With the autopilot off, the pilot must take manual control of the plane. 13 seconds later, another critical message. Flight control alternate law. This means that the automated system 
which prevents pilots from making unsafe maneuvers, switches off. 24 seconds later, another alarm, auto thrust off. It means that the system that normally automatically controls engine thrust to maintain airspeed and altitude is no longer working. The aircraft's automatic safety systems are shutting down, one by one. It must have been a very busy and confusing situation on the flight deck. Finally, at 2.14 and 26 seconds, just four minutes after the problems began, one final ominous message appears. The advisory cabin vertical speed message means that the pressurized cabin is descending at a high rate. In other words, the aircraft is descending at a high rate. Seconds later, flight 447 crashes into the Atlantic. What could cause such a cascade of system failures? The reason for the autopilot kicking out uh, is something that uh, clearly needs to be established. Tony Cable scans the ACARS data in search of the root cause. And he believes that all the failures can be traced back to just one of the 24 fault messages. This one message suggests that the computer lost the ability to calculate its airspeed. The loss of airspeed information potentially very, very serious. Without this, the automatic flight controls can't function, so the system shuts down. To find out why, the team turns their attention to the equipment that measures airspeed. All airliners measure airspeed using pitot probes. Forward-facing hollow tubes of metal just below the cockpit. Automated flight controls can't operate without accurate airspeed data. So the A330 has three pitots to provide backup. But on flight 447, the fault message suggests major pitot problems. We their, uh, the airspeed indication systems, all three of them, were compromised. In the wind tunnel, Tony Cable tries to find out why. Take it up to 30 knots, we'll try this time. A sensor inside the pitot tube measures the pressure of the air rushing into its open end. The computer converts the pressure into airspeed, in this case, around 30 knots. But cable can trigger a malfunction just by blocking the tube the measured airspeed drops to zero. But what can block a pitot tube at 35,000 feet? The pitot tube sticking out into the airstream means that it's vulnerable to being hit by ice and rain. It's a small device, small things pick up ice quicker than big things, so the pitot tube is prime candidate for picking up icing. To combat ice, the pitot tubes are designed with powerful heaters, intended to handle any conditions including full-blown storms. So what caused them to fail? The answer could lie within the storm itself. One of the, the things that uh, we're interested in is what were the conditions at 35,000 feet? What kind of ice or liquid was there at that altitude? John Williams turns again to the new NASA satellite images. One of the first things we want to do 
is try to figure out what the temperatures were at that level. He creates a cross-section, showing the temperature at different altitudes. What it shows starting at the surface and going up to the top of the atmosphere, they were flying at this level here. And you can see that the temperatures were about 40 below at the time and location of the accident. Minus 40 may seem extremely cold, but in fact, it's much warmer than is usual at 35,000 feet. These temperature readings suggest that an unusual phenomenon may have occurred. What we found out from this analysis is that it's possible that there was supercooled liquid water at the altitude of the aircraft. Supercooled water is a weird quirk of physics, where extremely pure water remains liquid at temperatures well below freezing. In 32 years' experience, Tony Cable has never actually seen this phenomenon up close. The purified water in these bottles is well below its normal freezing point. But it's still liquid. Ice crystals can only grow around tiny particles, like impurities or bubbles. When Cable inserts a metal tube, hey. instant ice. That is incredible. Hmm. The fact that air is really clean over the oceans suggests that if there's super cool liquid water in the atmosphere and an aircraft flies through that, those little droplets are ready to freeze as soon as they hit a surface. Supercooled liquid water could overwhelm heating elements in the pitot tubes and freeze them in seconds. It is possible that the aircraft encountered conditions which are more severe than those to which it had been designed. The pitot heads may not have been sufficient to cope with these severe conditions. The team discovers that pitot tube failure is not uncommon. In the six years leading up to the loss of Flight 447, the French authorities identified 32 failed pitot events involving A330s or similar A340s. And in 2009, the number of incidents is alarming.